Um, today we're actually going to be giving two talks. Um, this is our first talk. It's titled Deeper Door Exploiting the NIC Chipset. Um, our second talk is actually going to build upon this talk. Um, we're going to talk about how we've integrated some of the, uh, the uh, network card exploitation into a system management mode rootkit that we've developed. And that's going to be the topic of our next talk. So um, today we're going to discuss the design and implementation of a chipset level rootkit that we've developed. Our rootkit functions as a um, stealthy covert channel to exchange command and control information. And we've nicknamed it Deeper Door. Um, Deeper Door is capable of covertly sending and receiving packets. Um, but perhaps more interestingly, it's capable of bypassing virtually every firewall or IDS that relies on Windows networking support. Um, we also want to use our back door to highlight um, a few issues in some of the existing firewall and IDS technology. So um, before we get started and delve into some of the gory details of the NIC chipset, um, I want to give a brief overview of the Windows network architecture. The Windows kernel network architecture is basically divided into two components. Um, the upper level component is called the um, TDI interface or the transport driver interface. It's implemented in TCP IP .sys. Um, TDI is used by a lot of firewalls and IDS systems for um, implementing traffic monitoring on a per process basis. Um, basically to associate network activity with a specific process. Um, it's a little bit easier to do that in TDI than it is in the lower interface. Um, the lower interface is called INDIS, or the Network Driver Interface Specification. Um, INDIS is um, implemented in INDIS.sys. A couple years ago, um, Joanna Rutkowska, most of you guys are probably familiar with her work if you're in here in the rootkit track, um, she developed a rootkit called Deep Door, which hooked into Indus at a very low level. Um, our rootkit that we're going to talk about today actually hooks into the system at a level lower than hers. Um, and there are some pros and cons to doing that. So um, most host-based firewalls still rely upon OS-assisted network monitoring. And by that, we mean they either hook into the TDI or the INDIS interface levels. Um, previous rootkits have demonstrated that there's lots of techniques to exploit this reliance upon the OS. Um, these techniques can range from simple techniques, like disabling a firewall driver or simply preventing it from loading, to um, complex hooks in either the, the INDIS or the TDI layers. Um, which are uh, representative of advanced rootkits like Joanna's um, Deep Door rootkit. Um, Alexander Tereshkin actually gave a Black Hat presentation um, called Rootkits Attacking Personal Firewalls, where he details some of these methods um, that can be used to <clears throat> exploit the INDIS layer of the OS networking architecture. Um, we're not going to go into all those details in our talk. Um, but we would refer you to his presentation if you want more details on the INDIS type attacks. Um, so if this is a weakness that is constantly exploited by rootkits, why do rootkits, or I mean, why do security software continue to rely upon the OS? Well, there's some very good reasons for that. Um, the first one is it's a matter of convenience. Um, it's very difficult to monitor the physical card interface in software and to do it in a um, reliable manner, in a stable manner that's compatible with a wide range of hardware. Um, this is because there's no OS protocol or stack support at that level. Um, also, it's generally accepted that higher level code is easier to write, more robust, um, more extensible. And then, of course, um, when you get down there below the OS, your code very quickly becomes very hardware specific. Um, so ensuring compatibility, which is an important thing for security software, um, wants to ensure as much compatibility across different hardware configurations, um, that becomes extremely difficult. It's also a matter of cost. Um, most of these types of attacks, a lot of them could be prevented by a hardware firewall. Um, however, hardware is expensive and software-based firewalls and IDS systems are cheaper. Um, this is especially true, of course, like in the um, home computing market, more so than in, you know, like server systems. 
So um, our root kit called Deeper Door, um, yes, it is a play off of Joanna's Deep Door root kit. Um, so we just want to spend a couple of slides um, kind of comparing and contrasting her approach with ours. And as you'll see, there's both pros and cons to both approaches. Um, Joanna's Deep Door root kit is operating system dependent. Um, we say that because it hooks into the Indus layer. Um, this gives it an advantage, though. Um, it is more flexible than our approach and also more widely deployable because, um, because it does hook into Indus, it will run on any Windows system. However, in, um, in the past couple of years, there's been an increasing trend towards the development of OS-independent malware. Um, that is malware that exists outside the OS, for example, um, in a virtual machine or um, even in the BIOS. So um, an Indus hook won't work for these kinds of advanced forms of malware that exist outside the OS. So our Deeper Door rootkit is operating system independent. We don't rely upon any of the OS networking subsystem components, either TDI or Indus. And our, in our interaction is completely within the chipset. Um, we interact both with the motherboard chipset as well as the um, chipset on board the LAN controller. The advantage of our approach is, of course, um, the fact that our approach can be easily applied to OS independent malware, like um, a VMM rootkit, like Blue Pill, or an SMM rootkit, um, which we're going to discuss in our next presentation. Of course, the disadvantage is, is that even though we are OS independent, um, we have to sacrifice um, and have chipset dependence. Um, and this limits our flexibility and the ability for us to deploy our system on um, a lot of different hardware configurations. Um, of course, we can mitigate this to a certain extent. We can always target um, widely deployed hardware configurations. Um, for example, like Dell systems tend to have fairly similar hardware configurations across the board, so we could target um, popular hardware configurations like that, but it will be difficult for us to support, you know, the same degree of compatibility that, a, um, that an operating system dependent backdoor could. So our deeper door um, covert channel was developed for the Intel 8255X chipset. Um, there are quite a few cards that are compatible with that chipset. Um, the Intel 8255X also has open documentation, um, so we were able to freely download um, the documentation off of Intel's site, which was very helpful. And then um, the Intel Pro 100B is, is pretty widely available. Um, and then, of course, we uh, had a couple of them sitting in a box at home, so all of those things kind of motivated our choice uh, to use this particular chipset. So um, since we're going to be interacting directly with the chipset, um, we wanted to give a little bit of background about the PCI configuration space. Um, basically, each device on the PCI bus has a configuration space. Um, each device's configuration space um, location is addressed by a triplet um, consisting of a bus, a device, and a function number. Um, each device also has a standardized header, which you can see um, if you look to the right, an example of a standard PCI configuration header. Um, we can also read and write the configuration space by programming two chipset registers. Um, these are called the configuration address register and the configuration data register. So um, basically we can think of the um, PCI configuration space as a large window, but we can only look at 32 bits of that window at a time. So we have to, um, we have to say what part of that configuration space we want to look at, and that's where this configuration address register comes in. Um, the configuration address register contains the information that is used to locate a device. Um, the bus number, the device number, the function number, register number, and then an offset within the header. Um, so basically what we have to do is we have to program the configuration address register um, with the location of the device configuration space that we want to access. Um, the configuration address register is located on port CF8. 
and is accessible through standard I.O. So basically the assembly in and out instructions um, can be used to program it. Um, once we have set the configuration address register, um, we can read the conf or write the configuration data register. Um, the configuration data register can now be used to receive the contents um, or the data that is stored at that location in the configuration space. The configuration data register is located at port CFC and like the configuration address register, um, it is able to be accessed using standard port I.O. or the assembly in and out instructions. Um, so we want to give a, an overview of the 8255X architecture at this point. Um, it consists of two components. The first component is the command unit, which for our purposes um, is primarily involved with frame transmission. Um, this is how we're going to send data out. Um, it also does some other commands as well, um, but we're not really interested in those. Um, the other component is the receive unit, and just like the name sounds, it's involved with frame reception. Um, there's several data structures involved. Um, these include the uh, control and status registers, called the CSR, um, the status control block, or the SCB, and then there's some data structures specifically involved in frame transmission and reception, like the command block list, the receive frame area, and the receive frame descriptor. And um, we'll discuss uh, the details of all those in the upcoming slides. So the control and status registers exist on the LAN controller. Um, they can be accessed either using port I.O. or shared memory, mapped memory. And the most important thing that the CSR holds um, is the status control block. Um, the status control block is important because it's used um, to manage communication between the host CPU um, and the LAN controller. So one of the first things we have to do is locate the CSR for the LAN controller. And in order to do that, we use that information um, we just went over um, because it's located in the PCI configuration space. Um, so here we have a standard PCI configuration header and then the header um, for our 8255X controller. And as you can see, um, one of the base address registers, which is um, specific to the card, is the CSR memory map base address register located at an offset of 10 hex on the diagram. Um, that contains the physical address pointer um, to the control and status registers for the card. Um, so we're going to locate the PCI configuration header and then we're going to locate the physical address of the CSR which are going to contain the chipset uh, registers for the LAN controller. So here's just a little snippet of code. Um, it's pretty straightforward to locate the CSR. Um, here we load the uh, port CFA into EDX. That's our configuration address register. Um, we load our bus device and function number, which is going to identify the location of our network card in the PCI configuration space. We move that into EAX. Um, we add 10 because that is the hex offset that you saw um, in the previous diagram, which is going to point to our um, CSR memory map base address <coughs> register. Um, so we're going to um, add that offset to EAX. And then we're going to issue an out instruction, um, which is going to cause us to set our configuration address register um, to the location of what's going to be um, the CSR pointer. Um, at that point, then we move CFC into EDX, which is our configuration um, data port and then we issue an in instruction um, which will cause us to read the value. So now at this point we should have um, the physical pointer to the CSR for the card. Um, this is the layout from, of the CSR um, right from the Intel documentation. The main fields that we're interested in here are the um, status control fields, the SCB command word, status word, and general pointer. Um, as we said previously, um, the SCB is the mechanism primarily used for communication back and forth between the LAN controller and the host CPU. Um, it consists of these three fields, the command word, the status word, and the general pointer. 
Um, the command word is just like it says. We can issue commands to the land controller by writing to the, to the command word. Um, we can receive information about the status of the controller by reading the status word. Um, the status word contains such things as um, the result of, of an interrupt on the device. Um, what caused an interrupt? Was it a frame arrival? Or um, error conditions that might have occurred? And then the general pointer value is, um, holds the physical address of different data structures that depend upon the value of um, what type of command you're trying to issue. So um, in this case, there's a bunch of different commands that, the, that, the, uh, that, the that you can issue to the device. Um, the one that we're primarily interested in is the CU star command because that is the command that will cause a packet to be transmitted out over the network. Um, but there's several other commands. There's a no op, there's a command unit resume, um, a load command unit base, um, a dump command. And um, for each of these commands, the SCB general pointer um, points to um, potentially a different data structure. In our case, for the CU start, for frame tra transmission, it's going to point to a linked list of what are called command blocks. Um, each command block having information for a specific command for, um, related to like being able to send out a packet. <coughs> um, there's also um, the receive unit. There's also specific values for the general pointer for the receive unit. Um, typically, the one we're interested in is the RU start um, because that's going to be a term concerned with frame reception. Um, and for RU start, the pointer is to the first receive frame descriptor in the receive frame area. And we'll talk exactly um, what those structures are here in a minute when we talk about um, sending data in. So the first thing we're going to talk about is data exfiltration, um, or sending data out. So the main data structure for that is the command block list. The command block list is a linked list in shared memory. Um, as we saw in the prior slide, the status control block general pointer um, is going to point to the physical address of the command block list um, when, when the card is in the transmit mode. Um, in the case of frame transmission, the command blocks are of a specific type called transmit command blocks. Um, the card also has two different modes. There's a simplified mode and a non-simplified mode. Um, in a simplified mode, the frame data follows the transmit command block consecutively in physical memory. Um, in non-simplified mode, the transmit command block contains um, a physical address pointer to the frame data, which can be stored um, anywhere else in physical memory. Um, we're using simplified mode. So um, sending data out over the card is, is actually really easy. Um, it's, it's actually embarrassingly easy. Um, but it's also very difficult to detect. So we're going to go through the steps um, of sending data out. Um, the first step that we did, we allocate a transmit command block, um, one of the TCBs um, that you saw in the prior slide. Um, we want to allocate enough memory to hold both the transmit command block as well as the data payload. Um, this is because we're operating in simplified mode, um, which means that the data directly follows the transmit command block. So the second step is to initialize the TCB. Um, there are several bits that we need to initialize. Um, the first one, the EL bit, indicates that this is the last transmit command block in the command block list um, because we're only going to send one packet. So we're dealing with the absolute most simplest configuration, um, sending one packet at a time. So our list consists of one command block. Um, so EL will be set. The 100 that you see indicates that this is a transmit command block as opposed to some other kind of command block. Um, the link address would normally contain the physical pointer um, to the next transmit <coughs> command block in memory. Um, however, in our case, since we are only dealing with one transmit command block, um, we set this to zero. Um, the transmit buffer descriptor array address refers to um, if we were not executing in simplified mode, 
where our data frame would be located somewhere else in memory. Um, in our case, we don't need to deal with that field, so we set it to a negative one as, um, as the documentation defines. The um, transmit command block byte count is simply the number of bytes in our frame. And then the transmit threshold is how many bytes um, have to be received into the frame buffer before the LAN controller will actually start sending um, out the data. The minimum value for that is one, so we set it to one, so um, as soon as there's one byte in there, it, initially, it goes ahead and um, initiates ex execution to um, send the packet out. So um, the next step is to build the data packet. Um, we have to build our packets manually because we don't have any access to the Windows kernel network stack or API. So for simplicity, we chose to use UDP. So our packet structure consists of an Ethernet header followed by an IP header followed by a UDP header, um, followed by our data payload. So we initialize our packet and we copy our data packet into memory directly following um, the TCB that we initialized in the previous step. Um, now that the, our data structures are all set up, we need to check that the LAN controller is either idle or suspended. Um, we don't want to interfere with any activity that's um, occurring at the moment on the LAN controller. Um, so we check the STB status word, and in the status word is a field called the command unit status. So basically we're just checking this command unit status field to see if we have a value for idle or suspended. Um, when the command unit's idle or suspended, we can load the address of the transmit command block. The address of the transmit command block is loaded into that general pointer field that we discussed earlier, which depends on the type of command that you're sending. So um, for the case of a transmit command, it's going, going to contain the physical address of the transmit command block. Um, so here's just kind of this real simple little structure we have for, um, for sending out our packet. We have the um, status control block, and in the status control block is a general pointer, which contains a physical address pointer to our transmit command block that we've initialized, and then directly following that is our UDP packet. So um, once we've done all that, which um, doesn't really take a whole lot of code, we can send the packet. We send the packet by writing a CU start into the system control block's command word. Um, this causes the command unit to begin executing the transmit command blocks that will cause the data payload to be sent out over the network. So um, this actually, it, I think most people would agree, ends up um, being a lot easier than trying to write an indus driver. Um, even though it is specific um, to the Intel 8255X chipset. Um, it's also very stealthy. Um, we don't have to make any detectable changes to the host OS networking components or data structures. Um, pretty much the only thing we need to know is the location of the card's shared memory space and just read and write a few registers on the card in that status control block. Um, also, on a non-virtualized system, there really isn't an easy way to monitor the LAN controller. Um, for uh, memory mapped writes to the status control block. Um, the 8255X data structures are addressed physically, not virtually, and there's not really a good way to um, intercept those accesses and attempt to validate them um, in any manner. So um, that was pretty easy. I think there's kind of a general conception that writing low level code like this um, has to be really complex and difficult. Um, but it doesn't necessarily. In fact, as um, taking the offensive perspective, we kind of have the edge. Um, writing this kind of code for a piece of security software or like for a firewall that, say, wanted to, um, wanted to monitor the card at that level or something, um, that would be complex and difficult because the firewall would have to, um, one, have a, a large degree of compatibility across different hardware configurations. So supporting one or just a few chipsets wouldn't be adequate. And also it needs to ensure stability. Um, our code is pretty stable, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to say that we've <laughs> never had a blue screen. So um, the uh, malware developer doesn't really need to be so concerned about either compatibility or stability. You know, it may be sufficient for the malware author to, um, they may know what machine they want to target, what their target is running in terms of hardware. 
or it may be sufficient to target a subset of hardware. Um, so they don't need the same kind of compatibility and they don't need the same kind of stability. You know, if it runs 90% of the time, it may be sufficient. Um, where the firewall, you know, is going to have to answer to their customers if they're getting blue screens even, you know, one-tenth of a percent of the time. So um, now that we've shown how easy it is to exfiltrate data, um, let's talk a little bit more about this problem. Um, many intrusion detection systems and firewalls um, tend to be inadequate when it comes to monitoring outgoing traffic. Um, for example, the Windows XP firewall doesn't monitor outgoing traffic at all. Um, Windows Vista added support for outbound monitoring but leaves it disabled by default. Um, a lot of third-party firewalls and IDS systems have tried to add outbound monitoring support, but a lot of them tend to assume that connections have to originate from a process or an application. And this is clearly um, not the case for kernel malware and definitely not the case for something like Deeper Door. Um, the main vulnerability here is the fact that it becomes extremely easy to exfiltrate sensitive information out from a machine. Um, in a manner that's a lot easier than like writing an Indus driver, provided that you know you can deal with the fact that you're you have limited compatibility and can only support limited hardware. Um, the threat of data exfiltration it has implications both at the personal level as well as the corporate level. On the personal level, um, probably the biggest issue is identity theft. Identity theft is a growing problem. And spyware and adware are more prevalent than ever. Um, there was an AOL NCSA study that showed that 80% of home computers are infected with an average of 93 spyware components. Um, most of us have some kind of personally identifying or sensitive data stored on our computers. So I think this is, this is a concern for all of us, even for the home computer user. Um, on the commercial end, I think regulatory compliance is a big issue. Um, we have laws now like the HIPAA Act and the PCI DSS Act, um, which govern the disclosure of consumer inf information, like health information or credit card information. Um, there's also privacy and notification laws that require consumers to be notified of breaches. Um, clearly, breaches can be costly not only in terms of money, but also in terms <coughs> of public relations. And then finally, um, the exfiltration of information like this can result in delayed detection in response to other kinds of malware threats. Um, for example, DDoS attacks or botnets or worms. Um, so now, now, we wanna, now that we've talked about um, how easy it is to exfiltrate data out, um, we'd like to talk a little bit about um, bringing data in and see if bringing data in um, is as stealthy or um, more difficult than sending data out. So one of the primary data structures for frame reception is the receive frame area. The receive frame area is a shared memory region. Um, it consists of um, receive frame it consists of some number of receive frame descriptor structures. Um, and there is one RFD per receive frame. So each RFD describes one frame that has been received by the LAN controller. So um, here's the layout of a receive frame descriptor. Um, we're only interested in a, in a few of the fields here um, for being able to receive data. The first one is the EL bit. The EL bit um, indicates that this is the last receive frame descriptor in the list because the list of receive frame descriptors is similar to our list of command blocks. It's a singly linked list, singly linked list. And the EL bit indicates that this is the last element in the list. Um, the C bit and the OK bit kind of mean the same thing. They mean that a frame was received, a complete frame was received successfully. Um, the link address is the physical address pointer to the next block in the list. And then finally, the count contains um, the number of bytes contained in the receive frame. So packet reception occurs when the device detects a frame on the link with a match on the address. Um, when a match is detected, this causes the frame to be transferred to the receive FIFO, um, which causes the NICS DMA unit to transfer the frame to main memory. 
Um, once that frame has been transferred, the NIC generates a frame receive or an FR interrupt. Um, normally, the interrupt handler is responsible for extracting data from the receive frame descriptors um, contained in the receive frame area, um, setting some status bits in the receive frame descriptor, and then passing the packet on up um, the Windows networking stack. So on Windows, under normal operation, the receive frame error area is managed between um, Indus and the details are managed by the Intel bus driver, which in this case is E100B325.sys. So um, there's a couple steps involved in intercepting packets. First thing we need to do is we need to locate that receive frame area, um, and we need to, to uh, map that physical memory. Um, we're also going to need to intercept the FR interrupt as well. So when an interrupt from the NIC is received, um, the first thing we have to do is determine if it's due to a frame arrival. Um, any given IRQ can actually be shared by multiple devices, so it's um, the responsibility of the interrupt handler for a particular device to determine if that interrupt um, is the result of uh, the, the device that it's handling. So we can check the FR bit by checking the SCB status word. Um, bit 14 is the uh, status bit for the uh, FR interrupt, and if it's set, it indicates that the receive unit has finished receiving a frame. So if, in fact, this is an FR interrupt, um, at this point we want to locate the start of the receive frame area. We can do that using the status control block general pointer. Um, remember when the um, card is in receive mode, the general pointer points to um, a linked list of receive frame descriptors. So at this point, we want to walk the list of receive frame descriptors and scan the data portion of each one, the frame data, and look for a command and control signature that indicates um, a special packet for our rootkit. So if the packet contains our command and control signature, um, there's a couple of different things we can do. Um, we could erase the packet. Um, or we could change the payload to resemble something innocent. Um, for example, like an ICMP echo request. Um, later, a little bit later, Sean's going to do a demo that, that um, shows a couple of different scenarios and how the OS, how the OS handles that. Um, in the case of an ICMP echo request, um, the OS will actually reply, um, which is, is kind of interesting because you could you know, almost use that like, to, to, know, to know if your, uh, your rootkit is still alive and uh, sending data out. Um, otherwise, if the packet doesn't have our command and control signature, um, we pass control to the OS handler and let it process the packet normally. So for um, the people out there that are familiar with rootkits, um, you can probably imagine that this is a lot easier to detect than um, the sending data out. Um, that's due to the fact that we have to intercept the FR interrupt. Um, in the simplest case, that involves hooking the interrupt descriptor table. Um, for a long time, rootkit detectors have used heuristics to say um, if entries in the IDT don't point within um, known OS modules, uh, then they're flagged as being suspicious. Um, so one option would be to hook the IDT a little bit stealthier. Um, there was a recent FRAC article that talked about modifying the um, KI interrupt template routine. Um, I don't think most of the detectors out there are currently um, looking for that kind of thing. Um, also, we played around with um, redirecting the interrupt. So basically, in the IO APIC, so basically what we did is we tried to get the, um, the, the um, interrupt for the NIC to interrupt on a different vector than what the OS was expecting. Um, so then we could just hook like a, an empty interrupt in the interrupt descriptor table that wasn't being used by the OS um, for any particular reason. Um, unfortunately, you know, we still modified the IDT, so there was like a heuristic there that, you know, something had changed even though it wasn't what, you know, the OS thought was the NIC interrupt handler. Um, alternatively, we could maybe use something like IO Connect Interrupt and try to do it in more of a legitimate manner so we didn't change a pointer directly in the IDT. Um, that also might be a little bit stealthier. Um, however, 
We could actually make this a lot, lot better um, by placing this backdoor into a bare bones VMM, like Blue Pill, for example. Um, it's not, it would not be particularly hard to do this. Um, we could set the VMM to exit on the NIC interrupt, and then that would totally avoid the need to hook the IDT. So um, probably the biggest point of detectability um, of this type of, of a uh, backdoor could be eliminated by putting it in a VMM. Um, actually, in our next talk, we do actually put it in an SMM rootkit. So our SMM rootkit also has network backdoor functionality, um, and we can send data out um, right through any kind of firewall that is uh, locally on the system. We've tested our code against um, several commercial um, IDSs and firewalls. Um, these include the Windows XP firewall, the Zone Alarm Security Suite, as well as the Snort IDS. Um, theoretically, we should bypass any host-based firewall or IDS that operates at the Indus level or above. Um, we verified it on two cards. Um, that support the Intel 8255X. These are the Intel Pro 100B and the Pro 100S. Um, probably the biggest limitation to our approach, and we won't lie to you, you know, I mean, it is very hardware and chipset specific in its, um, in its current form. Um, this makes it suited more towards, you know, sophisticated targeted attacks where there is some knowledge of the target's hardware configuration. Um, that's not totally an unreasonable scenario. I'm sure that there's, um, there are times when you have some idea of what hardware configuration your target might be running. Um, this may or may not be a huge problem, as we said earlier. Um, the attacker tends to have the advantage because um, he or she can target, you know, more widely deployed chipsets. You know, we can't, we can't support everything, but we can support the chipset that is most likely to be found out in the wild, or the handful of chipsets most likely to be found out in the wild. Um, as we said, the Intel 8255X is fairly widely deployed and backwards compatible, and, and also extending our backdoor to work on other cards would not be that difficult. Um, for example, Intel freely provides all of their, um, or not all, but a large number of their um, LAN controller uh, uh, data sheets and you know information. Um, let's see, as far as prevention goes, um, probably not a big surprise, but um, maybe the OS isn't the best place for a firewall or an IDS. Um, we could move low-level parts of the OS networking subsystem into a trusted VMM or firewalls and IDSs um, into a VMM. Um, there is quite a few new processor and chip technologies that are being developed um, that will hopefully greatly improve um, these kinds of threats and allow us to develop more effective security software. Um, for example, Intel VTD supports um, an IO MMU um, and provides for IO virtualization, which will allow for um, more isolation between um, the host CPU and peripheral hardware. Also, they have their trusted ex execution technology, um, which is built upon their safer mode extensions, um, which promises to provide secure communication between um, peripheral devices, as well as to provide a um, protected execution environment. Um, lastly, hardware firewalls are going to be immune to deeper door. Um, deeper door runs on the system, so it can't subvert a hardware firewall. It can only subvert host-based firewalls. So um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Sean. Um, he's going to do our live demo. Hi, everybody. We're going to try and run a live demo as live as possible. OK, so we just have two systems. We have the target over here, and then we have the uh, machine that's going to try and, and then we have the system over here that's going to try and send the command and control and receive information back. So the first thing we'll do on this command and control machine is open network monitor, because we want to be able to. Uh,
on the command machine, we're going to open network monitor because we want to try and see if, uh, you know, we want to filter for the replies to make sure that it's actually working and sending data back. So we create a new capture tab. And since the IP over here is 101 and the IP over here is 103, so I have a little filter. We'll just open it up. It's pretty standard. It's just going to listen for source address of 101 and UDP because UDP, like we saw before, is the packet that we're using to send out on. So we apply the filter and just put this in monitor mode. Uh, we're also going to send some command packets from here, so try and create a little space for that so we can see those going on. Now over on the target, we're just going to install the driver. All right, so here we go. Pull open debug view. Pull open OSR loader. Great for installing drivers. And here's deeper door. All right, so there we are. There's just some information. We're going to clear that out so we can see what's going on when the packets arrive. Now, the first thing you see is these um, these dots that are going to print out. Deeper door has a secondary thread that just sends a dot out every 10 seconds, so to kind of know that it's there and it's still running. It's nice. So over here, we don't have zone alarm running. We've turned that off. And we don't have Windows firewall going. We've turned that off. So to begin with, there's no firewalls or anything, just to set a baseline. We don't need this. We will pull open network monitor. And the packets that will be coming in, the command packets are ICMP. Well, they're actually, I think, TFTP, but no, no, they're ICMP. So we will start a capture tab so that we can try and bring those in so we can see if any, anything's arriving. All right, so now we're all set up. Deeper door's running. We're monitoring traffic here without any firewalls, and we're going to send stuff over here. So we have two packets. We have the zero packet, and by the way, this program is Network Packet Generator, which is a nice little uh, program online that just lets you define packets uh, at the byte level. So we have two packets. We have a zero packet, which sends a command in that will just tell the driver, it will tell Deeper Door to do nothing but zero out the payload. So it won't mess with the headers, it'll just zero the payload. So what we'll be sending over is the signature, which is four asterisks, and then a command as in zero. And that'll just say zero out the payload and don't mess with the rest of the packet. This hide packet, it'll send over a packet which will have the four asterisks and then the command hide. And what that'll tell Deeper Door to do is to go ahead and not only zero out the payload, but zero out the headers and the entire packet and just keep the OS from even ever getting it. So we're just going to hide it from the OS as opposed to just zeroing out the data. Now, the other thing we talked about, Sherry talked about, was, and I, I, didn't, I didn't make one of these, but um, we have a disguises ping packet, which would be the same thing with the command to ping. And what that'll do is it'll zero the payload, the command payload, and then it'll just put a standard ICMP echo request. So it's like, uh, I think the data is like A through L and then starts over at A through G or something. And then it'll um, calculate checksums on the fly, put those in the packet, and then send that on up to the OS. And the OS will get it and think that it's being pinged and reply back out. We don't have one of those, but it's not really going to show anything new. So. All right, so we have this. We'll go ahead and clear this window. We're going to try and keep a one-to-one -one correspondence so we can see that there's one-to-one -one going on. So I'll send a zero. So we get a zero uh, command. So we see the deeper door got it. There's our signature, four asterisks. There's our command zero. I guess you could put an argument in there if you wanted. So it gets it, and you see that it, it sends it on up, so Network Monitor is going to see it. But if we go look in the data, we can see that it's all been zeroed out. So the zero packet, that's all it does. It just zeroes the payload, 
and sends it on up. So network monitor gets it and sees it as a, an echo reply with zero data. Normally it's like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So that's nice. So we'll do a hide packet. Now in the hide packet, we see deeper door gets it. But this time deeper says, deeper door says, okay, we want to hide it. So we're going to zero out the payload and we're going to basically kill the packet and not give it to the OS. So deeper door sees it, but we see network monitor doesn't see it. The last one it saw was the, the hide. In this case, uh, network monitor doesn't see it, the OS doesn't see it. And one other thing is that I forgot that's always nice is on the first one where we did the zero, here's our UDP reply from deeper door. I wish we had more screen real estate. So there's the, for the first packet we sent, here's the reply. And then for the second packet we sent, here's also a reply. So that's deeper door, just taking the packet, putting whatever you want to put in it, sending it back out. So that's all normal because there's no firewall. We would expect that. So we'll clear everything back out so we can say synchronized and we'll load up, let's say Windows Firewall. Turn it on, don't allow any exceptions so it should block everything out. And then the same game. We'll send a zero, zero packet. And we'll see here's the zero packet showing up. Here it is and the OS sees it but the data's been zeroed out. And then over here on the command machine we see the reply. So that's going right through Windows Firewall. And then likewise we can send a, a hide packet. And the only difference being here is that Deeper Door still gets it but the OS doesn't. So in this case, really it's not even getting to the Windows Network Firewall so it doesn't get that far but we still receive a, a reply over here on our command machine. So as far as Windows Firewall is going, Deeper Door is able to receive and transmit in and out through it with uh, not too much trouble. So we'll turn up the heat on it and we'll try Zone Alarm. Zone Alarm seems to be a little more hardcore. It seems to be a little more hardcore and will actually block outgoing traffic and the like. It likes to ping the, um, the router so we'll just clear that out. If we look at Zone Alarm and we check out the firewall, our zone, here we are, our zone's internet. So we go, here's the internet zone, we can turn that up to high, we can turn the other one up to high for good measure. We can put the internet lock down and we're hidden and protected from hackers, so good. So we come over here and we will send a zero packet. Now in this case, we see Deeper Door gets the zero packet and all it did was zero the payload, so Zone Alarm is going to see it because it's still going to come through because we're not hiding it. So Zone Alarm, you know, oh, okay, I've blocked your internet access and I blocked a ping. Okay, that's great. Now, nothing's going to show up in Network Monitor anymore because Zone Alarm is going to block it earlier, so we don't even really need that. But if we look over here on the Command Center, although Zone Alarm popped up and said we blocked it, Deep Door has still sent right back out, so Zone Alarm didn't really block it. And it may be kind of annoying to have that little pop-up, so if we send a hide packet, rather than just zero the payload, if we hide it, Deeper Door gets it and Deeper Door replies, and this time we don't get the pop-up saying Zone Alarm blocked anything, because it's just gone. So Zone Alarm is, is a pretty good one, and it will proceed to block everything else on the computer. This is not us. I mean, I, I, Zone Alarm's got to use it for a long time, but as far as Deeper Door goes, it's just not, uh, it's not going to catch Deeper Door at this time. So we thought, sitting around, we're like, okay, great, it seems to get past most uh, firewalls without any problem. What else can we do? And we thought, well, what else can a user really do? And a long time ago, when I used to see the router lights start to blink a lot and get real paranoid that somebody was filtering my hard drive, I would just disable the network adapter. So I was like, okay, well maybe that's a good one. So we can go to Device Manager, see our network adapter, and just go ahead and disable it, cause it to stop functioning. We really want to do this. I would say yes. Okay, so now it's, it's disabled. Now when the network adapter is disabled, 
we're not going to be able to receive anymore because Windows has disabled its receive functionality. But if we look at this little thread over here, what I said that was a, a, another thread, what it actually does is every 10 seconds it wakes up and it checks to see if the card's been disabled um, by reading registers in the PCI configuration space. If it notices the card has been disabled, it goes ahead and re-enables the card and continues sending packets out. So if you look over here, and it helps if we turn the capture back on, what we're going to be seeing now is deeper doors still sending out packets every five seconds. So you may have lost your ability to send command and control in, but if you send a program to send out the hard drive or whatever, deeper door is still happily running. It's re-enabled the card underneath the windows, and it's still, as you can see, just happily sending data out. And it'll just keep doing that and keep doing that. Now, interestingly, Windows itself thinks the card's disabled, and if you try and use, uh, if you try and pop up Internet Explorer, it'll just give you a, you know, page not found. And if you actually re-enable it, then it will go ahead and work again, even though it already is re-enabled. So I'm guessing Windows just has some settings somewhere that says, I've, you know, I've disabled the card, and therefore it doesn't work. I've enabled the card, and therefore it'll work again. It doesn't really know that the card's working anyway. So deeper door plugs along. So we thought, okay, well, <laughs> disabling the card doesn't do any good. What else can we do? The only other thing I could think of short of pulling the cable out of the back of the machine is maybe we can just uninstall the adapter. If we uninstall the adapter, that should work, right? So we'll just tell Windows to uninstall the adapter. Now we don't have any network interface cards. But as we can see, Deeper door is still plugging along every five seconds. And if you look over on the command machine, we're still receiving data. So even though Windows has disabled the card and then gone ahead and uninstalled the card, Deeper door is still happy to just re-enable it and go ahead and keep on sending the data out. So you could have a problem. Like I said, I don't know what you could do after this. Uh, maybe unplug the cable. I mean, they say the best defense is to unplug the cable, and I guess that's true. So that concludes the Deeper Door presentation and the, uh, the demo. We thought that was pretty cool. Hopefully you liked it. Um, and we, I think we have some time to answer any questions. So if anybody has any questions, go ahead. Right. Well, as far as, as far as infecting it, um, you know, probably through some exploit, like kernel, you, exploit. kernel exploit, just like a worm or a virus or anything else would use. And then once you're in there, you know, since you're executing at the kernel mode, you can pretty much do anything. I mean, you could monitor to see if the IP changes. Like, we have a thread that monitors to see if the card was disabled, and if it, if it was, it just re-enables it. You could just have a thread that would monitor to see if the IP changed, and if it has, you know, create a packet that says this is my new IP and send it back out to the command machine. Um, pretty standard botnet type stuff, I would say. Yeah, but I mean, we haven't done any, we haven't, this is it, this is just proof of concept, so we haven't even tried to do any of that. Any other questions? Yeah. A reboot? Uh, we're not actually flashing the NIC. We're not doing anything that involves any flash memory. So, if, I mean, f reflash, we haven't changed the flash, so if you reflashed it, wouldn't it be zero? Um, we're, just, we're just talking to the card at a really low level. Yeah. We're just, you know, accessing its chipset registers and directly sending commands um, rather than having to go through the OS, like through the Indus interface or, you know, upper level interface. Yeah, we haven't flashed the card, so we haven't changed anything like that. Yeah? Uh, well, that's why before you, you send, like when Deeper Door wants to send a packet out, that's why if you look through the, the Intel manual, um, it's very important that you check the status of the receive unit and the command unit and make sure they're not active. Because if they are active, then, yeah, you'll run into big problems. So that's one thing we have to do before it sends out. It will check those status 
registers and wait until they're idle or suspended. In that case, you can just go ahead and go in and do your thing. Well, I mean, you can, since Deeper Door is just a driver running in the OS, it's just the same type of synchronization techniques that you would use for any other driver. Right, you can just CLI or whatever, whatever it takes. Any other questions? No, it yeah, is right. not persistent at this point. It's, there's no persistence here right now. Um, in our next talk, we're actually going to, we've integrated this into our SMM rootkit. So it's actually, um, I think it's a little bit more cool um, because it's, it's in an OS independent rootkit, um, which is running outside the OS. I think it's pretty cool that the card just keeps on sending out data even though you've disabled it and removed it. And it just keeps sending out until you reboot or unplug. All right. Okay, well, any other questions? No more questions. All right, well, thank you. Thanks.